Good afternoon. I'm Walter Edgar. We're going to today continue our conversation of South Carolina history. The topic today is the rise of Ben Tillman. And years ago, I had a former student ask me why, when I published the history of South Carolina, that I devoted a chapter to Ben Tillman, because in class, I made it quite clear I didn't care for him at all. I still don't. That's nothing new. But the man's impact on the history of South Carolina was significant. And so we need to talk about it. But to talk about Ben Tillman, we have to go back to the economic stress that South Carolina was facing in the 1880s. Farmers were wedded to King Cotton. Part of that was ignorance. Part of it was necessity. Merchants would not give farmers loans for the new crops people might be thinking, such as peanuts. Hadn't even got to soybeans yet. But anything other than cotton, they weren't going to lend them any money. And a crop lien, a lien on next year, on the crop you were producing was the only way that merchants, excuse me, that farmers could get the cash to buy the seeds to plant the year's crop. And as a result, the land suffered. Cotton's very, very hard on the soil. You have other factors, drought, army worms, crop failures, the collapse of cotton prices, and not till the 1920s do we have to deal with the boll weevil. Things were bad enough before then. And as a result, thousands of farmers in South Carolina, black and white, lost their land. In 1886, almost a million acres of land went for sale at public auction to pay taxes. Another 100,000 the next year. And in just that two-year period, almost 10% of the state's farmland went on the auction block. The state's leaders were either ignorant of the real situation or saying just everything was peachy. And so farmers decided to take matters into their own hands. First came the patrons of husbandry, commonly known as the Grange. The first one appeared in South Carolina in 1871. That's during Reconstruction. By 1875, there were 342 local chapters or granges and 10,000 white members. Rapid growth was followed by equally rapid decline. The sole accomplishment of the Grange in South Carolina was the creation of an agricultural bureau and state government. But the Grange was not able to do anything politically. In fact, it merged with the Bourbon Control State Agricultural and Mechanical Society. This was followed by a real political movement, the Farmers Alliance. The Southern Farmers Alliance was for whites, the Colored Farmers Alliances were for African Americans, and both entered South Carolina in the 1880s. Because of the desperate condition, they spread like wildfire. The first chapter or sub-alliance of the Southern Farmers Alliance was in Marion County in 1887. Three years later, there were 60,000 members. Now, not all members were farmers, although about 85 or 6 percent were. But just about half owned their own land. The rest were tenants and sharecroppers. Non-farmers included mechanics and professionals, and of course, politicians. Spartanburg's alliance senator who was supporting the alliance was actually a physician and a town resident, not a farmer. And they had a publication, The Cotton Plant, which was published in South Carolina until the early 20th century and then merged with the Progressive Farmer. And just a footnote for that, the Progressive Farmer eventually moved to Birmingham and became Southern Living. So, folks, it all begins here in South Carolina. And there was a Colored Farmers Alliance Almost to a person, all of its members were farmers, and by 1891, there were more than 40,000 in the state. What kind of success did they have? They did get an agricultural bureau established, funded by a 25 cent per ton on fertilizer. That's about six or seven dollars in today's money. And it functioned somewhat like a modern extension service. It was a clearinghouse for information on seeds, fertilizer, method of cultivation. It analyzed fertilizers for quality control, uh, provided some veterinary services, 
and it was a state had a state sub subsidy for agricultural and mechanical society. In 1887, the South Carolina College was reorganized as the University of South Carolina, and it had an agricultural department. One of the little known secrets, or sometimes it's a deliberate secret, is that the first moral land grant agricultural college in the state of South Carolina was the University of South Carolina. Now, and then there was talk. Folks liked to talk in those days. County farmers associations frequently were little more than debating societies, but talk was cheap. It didn't bring rain, it didn't raise cotton prices, didn't eradicate army worms, it didn't stop soil erosion, it didn't pay off liens. Now, the irony is, through a county association in 1885, these local talking societies provided a platform for the politicians who were running South Carolina. And for those in the 18, late 1880s and 1890s who would reshape South Carolina politics. Now, who was Benjamin Ryan Tillman? He was an Edg Edgefield County farmer. He chafed at the inaction of state government's response to the plight of farmers. He called himself a dirt farmer, but he was anything but a dirt farmer. Prior to the war, prior to the war, the Civil War, the Tillmans had owned more than a hundred slaves and had large land holdings. And Ben Tillman himself operated a 30 plow farm. That meant he had more than 10, 30 farm workers on his place farming his land. Not much of a dirt farmer. During the 1880s, he overextended himself. He was caught in the cycle of droughts and crop failures, but he did not lose his land. But he did see the need for crop diversification and agricultural education. He was one of the founders of the Edgefield County Agricultural Society in 1885, but his high-handed manner soon drove off more than half the original members. But those who remained became true believers in Ben Tillman's cause of agricultural reform. At a June address to the society, he said the farmers' problems could be traced to not keeping up with the times, the butchery of the soil, renting land to ignorant, lazy, former enslaved persons. At August 1885 meeting of the Grange and the South Carolina Agricultural and Mechanical Society in Bennettsville, he electrified the audience by repeating his remarks. He made vicious attacks on Wade Hampton and his followers, denouncing them and the conservatives for hoodwinking the people and for being in favor of lawyers and the bankers. Every initiative of the Agricultural Bureau were merely sops and bribes. He said the state society was disreputable. He then proposed a series of five resolutions. These remarks were received coolly by the agricultural establishment, and four other resolutions were defeated. Most of the audience cheered, however. They loved Ben Tillman. And then he was able to reach a wider audience. The News and Courier in Charleston opened its pages to a series of letters from the Edgefield farmer, who is now calling himself a reformer. Francis Dawson, the editor of the News and Courier, had tried unsuccessfully for years to get Hampton and the Bourbons to stop mooning about the past and look to the future, and he thought that Ben Tillman might be that answer. This was the largest newspaper in the state and it gave Tillman a statewide audience and credibility. There was a convention in Columbia in 1886, the farmers, a farmers meeting, and Tillman gave the keynote address. It was a relentless attack on inept politicians who, as he said, were more devoted to the memory of the Confederacy than the people who were living today. And he, they were not concerned about the working men who labored in the fields and who voted and who paid taxes. Anyone who supported him was a farmer. Anybody who opposed him, and he said, all of those gritty little men, office seekers, and their satellites. 
The state, he said, was infected with political leprosy and needed to be cleansed and purified. And he had a series of resolutions. Close the dude factory. That was the citadel. The dude factory with its bandbox soldiers. Use its building as an industrial school for girls. Separate the agricultural college from the university and let it be funded by attacks on fertilizers. We need experimental stations. Reform the Agricultural Bureau. Reduce government expenditures. There was a reaction by Hampton and the conservatives. They were on the defensive. They still controlled the state party in 1886. And they blocked Tillman's candidate for governor, John C. Shepard. Instead, John Peter Richardson was nominated by the Democratic Convention. Uh, he won that convention by 27 votes, but that was for all practical purposes he would be elected governor of South Carolina. And that should have sent a message to the old guard, but it did not. They were as truly ignorant of what was going on as the Bourbons in France had been after the restoration of the monarchy. In 1888, they rejected Tillman's call for nomination by primary instead of convention. And they amended the Constitution to prevent reapportionment for occurring in 1891. They believed they had stopped Tillman in his tracks. But things always happen that are not planned. And this was the Clemson bequest. Thomas Green Clemson, who was married to John C. Calhoun's daughter, Anna Maria, had been interested in agricultural reform. And he left his Fort Hill estate to the state of South Carolina, along with cash to create an agricultural college. It would have a 13-member board of trustees, seven of whom would be life trustees. And Tillman was named as one of the original life trustees. There was a lengthy lawsuit on behalf of children, the grandchildren of John C. Calhoun. Eventually, it was decided in favor of the will, and the General Assembly in 1889 accepted the Clemson bequest. That was a tremendous victory for Tillman. And at the Farmers' Convention in March 1890, the delegates voted not to name a slave for public office, and Tillman's henchmen simply announced a recount. And when they had the recount, whoops, guess what? Then Tillman won the recount. There was considerable opposition. There was fear that the white vote might be split. There was disgust with Tillman personally. What was he really trying to do? He was not a tribune of the people. It didn't take a genius to figure if you've got a 30 plow farm, you're not a clodhopper. The Greenville News said the farmers movement of the farmers by the farmers for the farmers has been twisted into a Tillman movement for Tillman by Tillman. At the state con democratic convention, Tillman's followers controlled the county delegations. The conservatives tried to undo the rules and called for a primary, they lost that one. And they set the rules and called another convention and Tillman and his entire slate of constitutional officers were nominated. Hardcore conservatives led by A.C. Haskell of Richland County bolted the party and appealed to the state's remaining African-American voters. But they got nowhere because South Carolina is still a state that is 60% African-American. You cannot split the white vote. At stump meetings, and yes, they were doing stump meetings in those days, every county, politicians, the candidates would stand up and speak extemporaneously for hours. Tillman was relentless. He blamed the Bourbons for everything. They caused the drought. They caused low cotton prices. They spent too much money on government. They had no vision. He blamed them for the hurricane of 1883 and the 1886 earthquake. That one didn't go too well, but he tried. That was about the only thing he couldn't lay, excuse me, about the only thing he could not lay at the conservative's doorstep. He denounced the greedy old city of Charleston, the blank dumb of Beaufort, referring to the town that was almost 90% African-American. He 
damned the University of South Carolina as the seedbed of the aristocracy. The Bourbons, he said, were broken down aristocrats who viewed the world through antebellum spectacles and men who marched backwards if they marched at all. He had a campaign strategy, dressed simply and roughly. He dressed like he was a clodhopper. He proclaimed himself to be a plain, simple farmer who dared to take on the ring that ran South Carolina. Now, Tillman was a dynamic speaker. He was an expert at appealing to the darker sides of men's natures. He spoke to prejudices of particular audiences, the poor versus the rich, the tenant versus the landowner, upcountry versus low country, county versus town, all of South Carolina versus Columbia and Charleston, white versus black, do somethings versus do nothings, in versus out. And whoever the underdog was, Tillman championed them. The opposition was dumbfounded and confounded by the nastiness of the debates, not unlike some 20th century politicians with TV and the internet. Tillman's campaign pl platform, the agricultural college had already become a reality. His real goal was personal power. And the voters believed. They believed all the bad things about the Bourbons. They really believed that Tillman was a Moses who could lower interest rates, raise cotton prices, lead his people, the clodhoppers and dirt farmers, to the promised land of prosperity. Tillmanism was not a class revolution as many old Hamptonites, conservatives, Bourbons, all the same, decried. Yes, they got tossed out of office. Bourbons were ineffective in office and on the stump. They were old, disorganized, simply hanging on to office. But Tillman won, and he won with the support of some of the old elite and a goodly portion of the state's middle class. He had a superior organization, and he had white unity. Tillmanism was a political machine, not a social or political revolution. Well, that's great. He wins the election. What's he going to do when he gets to office? The first thing he chose to do was to humiliate the conservatives. He had clear majorities in both houses of the General Assembly, and the General Assembly still elected our state senators. Wade Hampton was up for re-election. He refused to lobby or beg for the election. Tillman, backed by his chief of political tricks, elected J.L. Irby, to me, J.L.M. Irby, an habitual drunkard and an accused murderer. Even former Confederate veterans abandoned their war hero and followed Ben Tillman's orders. Among his actions, he dismantled the University of South Carolina. It became the South Carolina College once again, simply, simply a liberal arts college. I mean, after all, why be a university and have an agricultural school if we've got one up at Clemson? We don't need a law school. We don't need a medical school. We don't need this. We don't need that just a little liberal arts college. He chose not to close the Citadel, but cut its funding drastically. He did create Winthrop Normal, Normal School, that is a teaching school for young women, and moved it from Columbia to Rock Hill to become the state college for women. He raised taxes on corporations, and he renegotiated the state's agreements with phosphates. Uh, phosphates were mined for fertilizer, and South Carolina had a lot of phosphate deposits in the lower part of the state. And like any thing that is mined, you get so much tax or mine, not necessarily a tax, but you get a fee for so many tons removed. Well, he renegotiated that in favor of the state government and the phosphate industry literally collapsed. Um, could not afford to compete with cheaper phosphates that were now coming out of Florida and other places. Um, on reapportionment of the General Assembly. He saw to it that the low country lost four seats to up country counties. Um, the General Assembly refused to pass any railroad form legislation that he wanted. Um, the cropland law, which really would have helped farmers, was not even addressed. Cutting the cost of government, that was his big campaign promise. 
All politicians promise to cut government once they get in office, and Ben Tillman was, was no exception. But he had problems. Cutting the state budget meant he could not complete the Clemson campus. Uh, he withheld subsidies for the state fairs. And even with that, during his first year in office, Ben Tillman spent more than his Hamptonite conservative predecessors had averaged over the previous 10 years. But he said, hey, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's the Driftwood legislature. They disregarded the will of the people. And so he went into the 1892 election, and governors had to be elected every two years in those days. Uh, he was opposed by diehard conservatives, particularly in Richland and Sumter counties. They were well organized, they carried on valiantly in stump meetings, but they were no match for Tillman when it came to debate. He swept the state convention, and in their general election, the Driftwood legislators were cast out. 28 of the 36 senators elected that year were his people, and 102 out of 124 House members were his and he controlled five of the seven congressmen from the state. He controlled one, but it was interesting. It was a Republican. George Washington Murray, an African-American politician from Sumter County, a member of the Colored Farmers Alliance, uh, supported, as did many populists across the country, the free coinage of silver to have money ready for people, and he opposed President Grover Cleveland, and Ben Tillman hated President Grover Cleveland. And Tillman forced the election boards to declare Murray elected in the congressional election, and he was the last African American to serve in the general, I'm assuming in the Congress from South Carolina until the 21st century. To Tillman, an African-American Republican was more acceptable than a white conservative. Irony of ironies. And during his second term, now remember he is controlling the General Assembly, he got a railroad commission with power to regulate rates. He limited the textile industry work week to 66 hours. And he refunded the state debt at lower interest. And he reduced state salaries by 10% and launched an assault on the independence of the state's judiciary. And then he created the dispensary. I hope you've been collecting those bottles, folks. They're worth a whole lot. Most people find them today in old privy sites and yard dumps. In 1892, the voters of South Carolina had voted to favor prohibition. Go dry, completely dry, no liquor in South Carolina. And so the House of Representatives duly passed, uh, duly passed a prohibition bill and sent it to the Senate. In the waning days of the General Assembly, Tillman decided the bill had to be changed. And in the Senate, it was redrafted to create the dispensary, a state liquor monopoly. He said prohibition is unenforceable and the state should make its money from men's indulgences. The dispensary constables infuriated independent-loving Carolinians. They were high-handed, and we'll talk a few minutes about the dispensary war in Darlington. In Greenville, the mayor and sheriff supported the citizens who wouldn't let the constables enter their homes. And in Charleston, everybody there flouted the law as they have done for centuries. And blind tigers, that is, alehouses, taverns, but they called them blind tigers, operated openly. And the efforts by a mayor, who was one of Tillman's allies, to enforce the law resulted as being out, ousted for office. You don't interfere with Charlestonians in their drinks. Although it supplied nearly one half of the state's revenues, it became a source of incredible graft and corruption, almost as an opponent said, as corruptible and as corrupted as Louisiana. There was opposition to Tillman, particularly in Columbia and Richland County, which is, of course, Wade Hampton's home. Residents were furious at the way Hampton had been treated. 
Residents ignored the governor on the streets of the capital city, and the women of Columbia refused to call the First Lady. 1891 was a centennial year for Columbia. Uh, it was a two-day celebration, but the local citizens had held a massive gala dinner, but Wade Hampton was offered to was asked to offer the address, not the governor. And now we come to the dispensary war. Tilden called out the militia to put down what he termed insurrection in Darlington and Florence counties because they were, the folks were not reacting to the rules of the dispensary. Militia companies from Charleston, Columbia, Manning, Newberry, and Sumter refused to assemble when the governor ordered them to appear. And so he had to call out his wool hat boys and armed guards placed around Columbia, as well as being sent to the PD. He summoned the governor's guards, which was a Columbia unit, to the governor's mansion for a special reproof. Basically, he cussed them out. He lectured them in crude, earthy terms on their lack of courage and manliness, and then offered places of the militia to any man who would serve him when called upon. He was expecting repentance, but to a man they threw down their weapons and left the astonished governor speechless and alone standing on the steps of the governor's mansion. The state newspaper became the most vocal and effective critic of Ben Tillman and Tillmanism. They published a series, several dozen essays called The Chronicles of Zarakoboam. It was biting, witty criticism that often left Tillman and his lieutenants fuming. They could dish it out, the Tillmanites, but they couldn't take it. And I want to read a passage from one of the Chronicles of Zarakoboam. And I did that because you folks out here know your scriptures. It got very discouraging the last few years I teaching, was teaching. I could mention something from scripture and kids wouldn't have any idea. So when I said I was casting my pearls before swine, they didn't know what I was saying. Um, the, the, the worst not knowing was dealing with colonial history and the establishment of churches. South Carolina required seven people in the colonial period. And I said, why, how does this differ from the good book? When two or three, no, not a, and 90 students, not one young person raised his or her hand to say it. So, a few words from the prophet Zerachaboam. Now in the fullness of time arose one Benjamin, a man haughty of spirit and subtle of heart, who greatly deceived the people. The same as was spoken of by the prophet, saying, A one-eyed man shall be king among the blind. He feared not God, neither regarded man, and had his raiment of coarse cloth, cloth, and covered his head with a hat of wool, and his nether garment was held up by one gallus. Being desirous of ruling over all the people, he lifted up his voice against the scribes and the rulers and the judges of the people, and hardened his face against those who were the weavers of cloth, and went about to overthrow the tables of the money changers, and destroy those who carried travelers and merchandise for hire. And he lifted up his voice among the people and said, Hearken unto me this day and ponder my words. The country is filled with rottenness, and your rulers are but as lepers, and are debauched by the money changers, and are carried about whether ever they will by the carriers of travelers. They have laid burdens heavy and grievous to be borne upon the people, and I alone am able to deliver you out of their hands. But when these things were noised abroad, the people came running together and said among themselves, Surely this man is some great one, even Moses or Elijah or, Elijah, or that prophet which is to come. Whereupon they answered and said unto him, O Benjamin the Tilmanite, live forever. Take, we pray you, unto yourself the wisest among us, and let us fight against the rulers and scribes, that we may overcome them and deprive them of their holdings. Now, I think most of y'all can figure that out. The people in those days did, but to use scripture that way 
straight out of the Gospels and frame it in Old Testament terms was pretty incredible. And it, like I said, it left the Tillmanites fuming. Um, the News and Courier joined the state in opposition. Um, and so the two big newspapers in the South Carolina were opposed to Tillman, didn't make any difference. In 1894, he set his sights in the United States Senate, uh, and he was elected, because remember the General Assembly in those days elected the United States Senator, Senator. And we'll continue that conversation on our next, con next week. <laughs>